Hey there, eyeballs. In the paranormal news, we have ancient burial grounds giving new ideas to our ancestry, as well as so many exorcisms being performed that the Vatican has hired on some help. Some 10,000 new exorcists. All these stories and so much more. Because if it's odd to you, friend, it's on the odd to Newfoundland. It's the odd, odd, odd to Newfoundland. Ghostly greetings from your host, Jonathan. Mysteries, ghosts, monsters, and lore. East Coast esoterica and so much more. If it's up to you, friend, it's on the up to you, found line. <laughs> Ghostly greetings from the oldest city in North America. I'm your host, John Mallard, bringing you the best in East Coast esoterica. You, my friends, have stumbled upon the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. Welcome to episode 289 and feeling fine of your monthly paranormal variety show. And, and having your hair is better than eating all your kids' Halloween candy and coming up with excuses just like the Jimmy Kimmel skit. You know, I always thought it was kind of cruel. But let's be honest, all those chips and all those bars are so delicious. How could you not, how could you ever say no? Also, are you anything like me? Do you just like take like one bag of chips and like 15 like chocolate candy bars or whatever, and those little ones and just, just pig out on all of it and then stuff it all in the one bag so that it only seems like you had one bag of chips and, and no one is none the wiser? Yeah. Yeah. Don't fat shame me. <laughs> Holy macaroni. Before I go to the paranormal news, I'll put my CBC interview. I had a wonderful time on there. It was so much fun. And talked about my dear friend Steve Lake, whose episode, Steve Lake's Ghost Story from Halloween. Guys, I hope you got a chance to check out, out that, as well as the other 31 episodes of 31 Days of Halloween. That's right. All of October, there was 31 episodes. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed, well, Barb. She came on November 1st, wonderful medium, another great episode right before this one. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you're to and support your lowly podcasting friend, John. He needs your help to be famous. <laughs> I was also told by the sponsor to remind you folks to check out the links down below. Check out Akisanas as well as buy me a coffee. That's right. For a mere shekel, you can go in there and buy your favorite peril podcaster, me, a coffee. And this helps support me in all I do. Would really, really appreciate that. Although I would kind of prefer to sit with a coffee shop somewhere with you right now and just kind of chat about the paranormal. I really would. I hope your Halloween was safe. I hope everything's okay. I, I, I hope that you're, you're just thriving. I hope your lives are going well. And if they're not, I hope I can give you some peace and take your mind off stuff for just a little while. The Christmas season is upon us. We'll have a Christmas episode coming out very, very soon. But until then, it's November. And lest we forget, we just did Remembrance Day here in Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. I just want to say thank you to all of our servicemen and women out there. Without you, all of us weirdos would have no freedom of speech and nowhere to put our passion to. I had an awesome Halloween. I hope you guys did too. But Halloween may be over. It's true. But that doesn't mean the paranormal ends. In fact, lots of weird stuff happened between now and then. That's right. It's time for us to get into the paranormal news. <laughs> Somewhere between the funnies <laughs> and, and the obituaries is... Oh, oh yes. <laughs> the paranormal news. <laughs> Our first story means it's time for you to grab your explorer hat and join us on a wild ride to the rising star cave system in South Africa. Our daring paleontologist Lou Berger stumbled upon homonality remains. And let's just say it's like uncovering the ancient version of a hidden treasure. Because, you know, these fossils kind of stole the show here. And I want you guys to know all uh, about it. 
So in 2018, while Lou was playing Paleo Detective, he discovered oval-shaped interments that were like VIP lounges for our ancient pals. These holes weren't accidental. They were deliberately dug and filled in, turning the caves into the ultimate prehistoric escape. Really? An escape room? For at least five individuals, anyway. Talk about a rock-solid mystery. Now, researchers are dropping truth bombs like confetti here, folks. Shouting, guess what, folks? Mortuary practices weren't exclusive to big brain homo sapiens. That's right. Even hominins with brains the size of a snack pack were in on the afterlife action. Who knew the cavemen were trendsetters in the burial game, you know? Who knew that? But now we do know. But wait, there's more. Engravings forming geometrical shapes, including a rough hashtag figure, were found on a cave pillar nearby. Lou spilled a prehistoric tea, though, suggesting that maybe humans weren't the Picasso of ancient times after all. Now brace yourselves for some paleo drama, folks. Lou Berger. Our 57-year-old rebel with a pickaxe, so to speak. Well, he kind of pissed everyone off. Quite the stir back then, actually. Flashback to 2015 when he rocked the boat suggested homonality was more than just a big-headed enigma. Scientists were left scratching their heads, blaming it all on the big brain. But Lou, with a twinkle in his eye, declared, we're not about to tell the world that's not true. Enter Homo Nelody Skull, a rock star celebrity found in South Africa. While waiting for more analysis, these discoveries are rewriting the evolutionary script. According to the researchers, it's like giving our answers a plot twist they never saw coming. <laughs> so why is this all important? Well, this means that two different species, two different species, okay, who are not human, technically, they're ancestors, both buried or dead. Think about that. Two different species of human-like things buried their dead. What does that mean? It means that my God, there could have been many, 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 many versions of humans out there or close to humans that are a lot more like us than we probably give them credit for. And more highly involved than most of our closest ancestors are living today. Like chimpanzees, they'll bury their dead. They've been observed using tools. I don't know, man. To me, this is just such a weird story. But it's also really interesting to think that what evolved into us isn't necessarily the only branch that could have evolved into us. And like it br really brings forward the idea that, well, we know so very little about ourselves. I mean, I said it once, I'll say it again. There are no bigger revelations on this planet with anthropology than the idea that there's a missing link, so to speak. There's thousands of missing links. We have no idea who we are, where we came from. All we know is that we're ready for the next paranormal news story, which is... Well, another really interesting one. There's a cosmic revelation in this one. Okay. There's a discovery with Uranus, actually. And it came by going through data that actually came back to us 20 years ago. Scientists confirmed the presence of an infrared aura glowing in the northern regions of Uranus. This discovery not only unveils the mysteries of Uranian auroras, but also raises questions about why the planet is hotter than expected so far from the sun. Joining us to unravel the enigma is anthrophys astrophysicist Emma Thomas from the University of Leicester, UK. The temperature of gas giant planets, including Uranus, baffles us. They are much hotter than models predict, but only warmed by the sun. One theory suggests that energetic auras play a role, generating and pushing heat from the aura down towards the magnetic equator. What does that mean? Well, let's step back and understand what auras are first. These captivating lights show occur when energetic particles accelerate towards a planet along magnetic field lines. So why the heck would this be on the Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast? What does this have to do with anything strange and weird to Newfoundland? Well, well, dude, Uranus glows. <laughs> oh, I'm just having fun with you. i tell you who else is having lots of fun. Linda Blair. I'm not about to say that I believe Every single thing needs to be exercised. And it's kind of nice to capture demons on record sometimes, okay? But this is a fascinating, fascinating article that I kind of got here for you guys, okay? It's the curious resurgence of exorcisms in 2023. Despite a decline in religiosity in the U.S., the fascination with demons, possessions, and exorcism persists. In a chilling scene reminiscent of the Exorcist franchise, a little girl is tearing pages from the Bible and consuming them whole. But here's the twist. It's not the child herself taunting and munching on psalms. It's the devil making a comeback in the possession game, folks. 
Even as religiosity hits an all-time low in the U.S., almost 60% of Americans still believe in hell and the devil, by the way, fueling our enduring fascination with exorcisms from stories of possession in various world cultures to the iconic imagery of Roman collars and crucifixes, exorcisms have become deeply embedded in our collective psyche. I mean, everybody knows what that is, right? Christianity, despite its decline, remains a focal point for possession narratives. Jesus and the apostles were exorcists, for example. Yet, it's become a cornerstone of Catholic tradition, though historically that's theatrical than its cinematic depictions are. Obviously, everything really paranormal is never as crazy as in the movies. For Catholics, it's not as simple as Googling the nearest exorcist, though. Rigorous medical, psychological, and psychiatric testing is required before referral to an exorcist, and specific symptoms of possession must be evident. Father Vincent Lambert, exorcist of the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, outlines these signs, speaking unknown languages, superhuman strength, heightened perception, knowledge beyond one's capacity, and aversion to sacred elements. The Catholic Church has made efforts to distinguish possession from mental illness, preventing casual diagnoses. So what does this all mean? Why is it important? Well, surprisingly, the thir- surge in exorcism is not confined to Catholicism. The Pentecostal boom, with its fiery and literal approach to demon busting, is a driving force. Unlike the bureaucratic process of Catholic exorcisms, Pentecostal churches allow anyone claiming a Holy Spirit gift to perform those exorcisms. The growing demand for exorcisms aligned with the modern Western desire for quick fixes and alternative healing. Could emotional distress be expelled as decisively as a demon cast into the lake of fire? However, it's crucial to note that exorcism is not a spiritual Olympic. <laughs> it requires a commitment to invite God in, emphasizing faith, holiness, and, of course, virtue. How on earth do we do this? How do we continuously think that people are possessed? Well, sometimes we just run out of options. Sometimes we see someone who's so mentally ill, we, we think they're possessed. I think it's true. But there's more truth to meets the eye. I do believe someone can be possessed by a demon. I'm not saying I've seen it, but I've said I've seen people who've been touched, touched by something very, very dark. And their lives are not very nice until they do receive some kind of cleansing. So there you have it. I guess I'm on board the exorcism train, but I'm not really sure I want to be the conductor, so to speak. Moving on. Nothing like a nice celebrity ghost story to to keep you in the know, you know? One of my favorite singers and my wife's favorite singer was Amy Winehouse. And her father, Mitch, allegedly has been visited by her spirit since she's passed multiple times. The soul singer passed away back in 2011 from alcohol poisoning at the height of her career. Now, seven years later, Mitch claims he's witnessed her presence through a series of strange happenings. He did an interview with The Sun and shared his experiences. We do have our moments, particularly on her birthday, September 14th. It's hard, he said. After three years, I was thinking maybe that one day she will come back in some shape or form. And she does not, and she does come back, not physically, but spiritually, all the time. And Mitch implies with this that she's around often. There are lots of strange happenings, he claims. Her spirit comes and sits on the end of my bed. She just sits there, and it looks just like her with her beautiful face and she looks at me i say to her are you all right because i get nervous with her being there mitch doesn't seem to be afraid of her presence it's comforting in a way to know that she's here and around me he adds winehouse's father also explained how he believed he has visited by her or was visited by her through a black bird that looked like one of her tattoos the week after she died i was at my sister's house and we heard this thud and a black bird that looked identical to amy's tattoo flew into the glass We went and picked it up and put it on the perch, and it happened at night, of course, when birds don't fly, but it came back and sat on my foot, of all places. He's positive it was a message from Winehouse. He also added that when we put it back again, it came and sat in the middle of us and sang. I do now see blackbirds all the time, and you think, oh, it's only a bird, but it's her in my world. I'm sure of it. These supernatural situations, Mitch confessed, there are so many things that happen to me that I can't explain. And might not mean anything to anybody else. As Winehouse rose in the music world, she continually battled addictions and the perils of fame, something that was further explained in the 2015 documentary surrounding her life, Amy. In 2017, it was revealed that Mitch and Winehouse's family wanted to bring her life to the stage as a West End musical, a way to showcase her life as a musician instead of focusing on the substance abuse she's so famously known for. A musical celebrating her life and music it's being talked about for the near future, no to Mitch. It is something I'd really like to happen. I've said I'm happy for it to go ahead if it does. Which brings me to something, you know, 
he talks about these signs from the other side. He talks about seeing a bird that represents her because she had the black bird tattoo. This this bird comes in and like interacts with them and, and sings and stuff. It's just it's so raw and real. It's like it's hard to understand how somebody could see that, even a skeptic, and not be like, God, that's so weird. What do you guys think? Do you, do you think it's possible to be visited by your dead loved ones in bird form or any form at all? You know, I've always wanted to hear from my passed away grandpa. Love that guy. He was like the most awesome grandpa ever. And also, he was so into professional wrestling like me. I've always wanted to like hear from him somehow through wrestling. And, and it never did happen. But I hope that it will at some point. Let's do another story. You know what's scarier than ghosts, goblins, and witches and stuff from Halloween? <laughs> Realizing that some crucial part of your airplane is missing when you're in the air. A U.S.-bound plane took off from London last month with four damaged window panes, including two that were completely missing. They weren't even there, <laughs> according to UK air accident investigators. No one was injured by the window malfunctions, which appear to have been caused by high-power lights used to film shoot. The UK's Air Ancient Investigation Branch reported in a special bulletin published November 4th, the aircraft departed from London's Transit Airport on the morning of October 4th, carrying 11 crew members and 9 passengers, all of whom are employees of Tour Company of the Aircraft Operating Company. The report states, without elaborating on the Tour Company, though, the single aircraft, an Airbus A321, can seat more than 170 passengers. Several passengers recalled that after takeoff, the aircraft cabin seemed a little noisier. <laughs> you think? And colder than what they were used to. A crew member walked towards the back of the aircraft where he spotted a window seal flapping on the left side of the Can you imagine? It was flapping on the left side of the aircraft. He actually saw it. Oh, my God. Can you imagine the absolute terror that would cause? You're in the air. Things sound really loud when you look to. And planes are pretty loud sometimes, too, especially if you're seated on the wing. And you look over for the gremlin you think the problem is, and there's actually, like, a freaking window hanging out the plane. I would die. I would absolutely die. I think that's more fra- like more fear-inducing than anything I've ever heard. <laughs> like, and, and it might be my horrible fear of flying. I, I'm not a good flyer. I don't drink, but, like, I'll probably drink a few of those little champagnes before we take off if I'm allowed. Just to get the edge off. And like every time I fly, my hands are like firmly on the freaking handles of the seat. And I'm like, oh, God, oh, God. And if I looked out and I see that, I, I you know what? I, I just die. I would. <laughs> Moving on. You know, I'm all about anniversaries. Never can remember me and my wife's, but I can remember this one. November 12th, 1933, a man named Hugh Gray may as well have started the original viral trend of, well, Snapchat, <laughs> when he snapped the first known photograph of a creature lurking in Loch Ness. Now, naysayers would argue an unidentified object floating in Scotland's famous deep waters, but this was a weird picture. Either way, the image caused a ripple effect that's still being felt to this very day, with people across the world visiting Loch Ness in the hope of getting a photo of the Loch Ness monster themselves. But it hasn't just been casual visitors. Teams of investigators, underwater photographers, and search teams have tried to find conclusive evidence of the infamous water beast, also known as Nessie. In fact, the biggest search of the lock in 50 years took place over two days in August this year, with around 100 volunteers looking for the mysterious creature each day. The beast remained hidden throughout the time. So are there genuine believers in a giant, gigantic aquatic monster in 2023, or is the Loch Ness no more a mere tourist destination for travelers who want to say they've been? Well, here's where it all began. The first high-profile report of Nessie sighting was published by the Inver- Inverses Courier, 1933, after a local hotel manageress claimed she spotted a water beast in the lock. Aldi McKay described the moment she saw a fearsome-looking monster as she and her husband were driving near the water. Miss McKay's statement put Nessie on the map, but reported sightings at Loch Ness go all the way back to 565 A.D. According to historian Professor Henry H. Bauer, the Inverness Courier's report, along with Hugh Gray's photo taken later that year, sparked a global and long-lasting fascination with finding the elusive monster. So where are we now? We are now at least 1,155 official sightings in and counting. There have been nine log sightings this year alone, with the last one coming on the 7th of October, a man on a coach that was passing the lock. A much like with most jobs and hobbies, monster hunting has moved into the 21st century with 
With a Loch Ness tour site allowing you to investigate from the comfort of your home via 24-7 CCTV across the loch, numerous theories have been put forward over the years, including that of a creature may be a prehistoric marine reptile, a swimming circus elephant, yes, really, I'm not kidding, and most recently, a giant eel. So, real or not, it's a win-win, folks. James Cameron, known widely locals as Mr. Loch Ness, is the founder of Loch Ness Marketing, a company providing services to film and media crews on location at the loch. He estimates that this year alone, around 2 million tourists from around the world have visited Loch Ness, probably generating an excess of $55 million to the economy. Interest globally has never, ever been higher in the monster, he adds. When asked if he thinks there's a scenario where the search for Nessie stops, the 17-year-old says, even if artificial intelligence came out tomorrow with 100 reasons why there's nothing in Loch Ness, trust me, 50% of people would believe that there's something in Loch Ness. It's a win-win situation. People love the mystery, and the economy loves the people who come to visit. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. I really do. There's nothing freaking weirder than Nessie, honestly. And, uh, you know, he'll always be odd to Newfoundland to me, 100%. Got to say this, though. Got to say this, though. It is for everybody out there. If you ever do go to Loch Ness, please bring me back something. I don't care what. It is a little Nessie keychain something. Just, just, Just let me know, okay? Let's do one more story. Kaboom. Nothing scarier than nuclear fallout, right? Well... Here's something that's really strange, really odd, so to speak. Truffles from a nuclear fallout are making German wild boars radioactive. Scientists have finally determined why wild boars in Germany are still showing signs of radioactivity, and it has to do with their diet in addition to the after effects of nuclear weapon testing on the Chernobyl disaster. History's worst man-made disaster occurred in 1986, yet the level of radioactivity found in these wild boars hasn't gone down, something experts are now attributing to truffles, of all things. A large area of Europe, including Bavaria and southwestern Germany, was affected by nuclear fallout after the Ukrainian power plant exploded nearly 40 years ago. Elements from the reactor, such as silicium-137, can survive for decades, and it does not hit its half-life for approximately 30 years. That may seem like a long time, but it's not if you compare it to silicium-135, which has a half-life of 2.3 million years. So... You know, there's that. <laughs> Chernobyl-related contaminants in a variety of species have dropped in Bavarian forests over the past six decades. Hooray! Scientists, however, have not seen a decrease in the radioactive levels in boars. Boo. Since its half-life is 30, there was some confusion as to why these boars continue to have such high levels of it. There is even a term in the phenomenon, the wild boar paradox. So, what's the culprit? To determine the reason for this paradox, scientists examined the bodies of 48 boars in 11 Bavarian districts from 2019 to 2021. A study published in the Journal of Environmental Science and Technology concludes that nuclear weapons testing during the Cold War and radioactivity from Chernobyl led to a buildup of contaminants and fungi, including deer truffles, that the boar like to eat. These toxic truffles are to blame. To figure out the specific source of radioactivity, scientists examined the ratios of everything in these pigs' stomachs, whereas a low ratio points to nuclear reactors. Unfortunately, that was not the case. So, what does it mean? Well, it means that these boars are radioactive. <laughs> so I want you to think about that for a second. First off, i got to make the first joke, which is, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you know, bebop, okay? <laughs> i got to make that, like, hey, these guys hate those toy <laughs> That's my best bebop for you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. But anyway, can you imagine being attacked by a nuclear boar? <laughs> Getting attacked by any kind of animal is bad enough. Can you imagine being chased through the freaking forests of Chernobyl? This, this radioactive boar tries to bite you, stab you with his little tusks. That is one Pumbaa I do not want to come across. That is for sure. Anyhow, guys. We've had so many weird things, weird burial grounds, radioactive boars. I mean, this paranormal news has just been so much fun. Guys, I loved having you. I can't wait to talk to you again. Oh, and one more thing. Remember, if it's odd to you, it's on the odd to Newfoundland. Take care. Attention all Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn radio listeners. The Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast brings you the best in East Coast esoterica on the first of every month. 
Together, we can keep it growing by sharing the show on social media, subscribing to the show wherever you may be listening to it from, and by leaving feedback about your favorite episodes. John certainly needs a friend like you to help make his dreams come true. Minus the alien abduction dreams. That is not cool at all. The Odd to New Finland Paranormal Podcast. Always available. Always free. Always odd.